June 1995, American fighter pilot Scott O'Grady was on routine patrol over enemy territory in Bosnia. Missile in the air, missile in the air. Missile in the air, missile in the air, buggy. Magic, measure five two's just been hit. Scott O'Grady survived the missile strike, but was now drifting to Earth, miles behind enemy lines. Scott O'Grady faced the ultimate survival challenge, having to cope with the extreme conditions of war-torn Bosnia with next to no equipment, having to improvise shelter, water and food whilst evading Bosnian hunter forces. He managed to survive for five days before being rescued in a daring US military operation. In this program, I'm going to look at the training fast jet pilots are given to help them survive a situation like Scott O'Grady's. In just a few seconds, a fighter pilot can be catapulted from their jet worth millions of pounds into a Stone Age situation of surviving hand to mouth behind enemy lines. Here at RAF St Morgan, fighter pilots are embarking on an intensive three week course in combat survival and rescue. The men and women on this course are a mix of fighter pilots, navigators, and RAF helicopter personnel. Okay, you've just ejected and your seat's fallen away from you at high level. Go through the drills. Okay. Between them, they've been involved in many theatres of war, including Bosnia and the Gulf, to name a few. At a moment's notice, they could find themselves at war over desert, sea, jungle, or the Arctic. That's why over three weeks, this group of RAF air crews are going to be put through an intensive course in combat survival and rescue. That means learning how to find water, how to trap wild animals, learning how to make natural shelters, and how to evade capture. Fast Jet Pilot's most important piece of survival equipment is his ejector seat. In the eventuality that he has to ditch his plane, he first pulls on this yellow and black lever here between his legs. When he does that, he sets in motion a complex sequence of events. In a matter of a few seconds, the canopy above him explodes and shatters so he won't hit it. A telescoping pole extends and the seat and him are bodily ejected by rockets into the air. He finds himself then suspended by a small drogue parachute that stabilizes him. And when he reaches 10,000 feet, a full-size canopy deploys and the seat falls away from him, leaving him suspended with just his seat, which is also his personal survival pack. Go, 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 go! Two-thirds of the planet's surface is water, so being prepared for survival at sea is essential. Here they're experiencing what it would actually be like to be dragged by their parachute the moment after impact with the sea. Much of combat survival is dependent on learning specific drills. That way, when a crisis occurs, no one panics or hesitates. Instead, everyone follows the same well-drilled procedures. Aircraft emergency, you end up ejecting 20,000 feet. Faster than 10,000 feet, you leave the seat. First action. Right, check canopy. Yep. Canopy's up and good. Yep. Come down, visor goes up, mask comes off. When you land in the sea, you inflate your life jacket, ditch your parachute, and get into your self-inflating life raft. Timing is critical. In some parts of the world, the water is so cold that you'll die in a matter of minutes if you don't get out. Fast jet pilots who find themselves in this position at sea are completely dependent upon rescue because there's not very much equipment can be fitted in the space under their seat. Basically, in this raft, I've got some stoppers to fix any leaks, a small pair of bellows, a day-night flare, just half a litre of water and a packet of boiled sweets. Not a lot. So you can imagine that the most important piece of equipment, apart from this life raft, is the search and rescue beacon that sends a message via satellite to bring aid. The aircraft is sinking! Cut the painter! Cut the painter! Helicopters and larger military planes are equipped with far more substantial survival aids. 
This raft can hold 10 people and theoretically it would be possible to survive for months in one of these. Here they're using an osmosis pump which desalinates seawater. You might think that once you're in the raft your work's over, but actually it's just begun. Servicemen learn a drill to help them deal with these stressful situations. Protection, location, water and food. Protection, well, the raft provides a measure of that. Location, you've got to do things to enable yourself to be discovered and seen. Water, get the osmosis pump out, get it going, get some water on the go. And food, there's a fishing line, use that to try and catch some fish. All of these things keep you busy and improve your morale. Eight hours at sea can only give these RAF personnel a taster of what it would be like for real. But training like this has proven to save lives. Having completed the sea survival phase, the course moves on to the coastline to look at seashore survival and a whole different set of challenges. But if there's one environment that has the real potential to give you a good feed and plenty of fresh water, then it's the coastal one. The best type of survival food is that which you can pick up with your hands. And at low tide, these rocks are covered in nutritious food. Most of the group are collecting mussels, probably because that's what they're familiar with. In fact, mussels wouldn't be my first choice. I'd go for limpets because they're grazers and much less likely to concentrate poisons than mussels do, which are filter feeders. Of course, in survival, water is a much higher priority than food. Finding drinking water along the coastline can be a real challenge. Over the years, the military have developed many ingenious ways of getting water, like collecting rain from cracks in the cliff face. There's a natural fissure you can see coming down there, and there's a right line of plants that grow up above it. Having identified where the water is going to be tracking down, dig down a bit, establish a pool, and allow the water to gather there. And then with a piece of rope or something that you found on the beach that can act as a natural wick, hold it in there, wedge it in with a stone or something like that, and already you can see the water has moistened the rope, so it's just dripping off all over the place. Down here, you can see that we've filled a four-pint container just from this very small crevice here. This amount of water has been caught from that device over about 40 minutes to an hour. It's like a dripping tap. British service personnel can find themselves serving in any corner of the globe, so all of these techniques they're learning here are vitally important. When it comes to water, they learn that it's second in importance only to air. So a technique like this, turning a common army poncho into a rain trap, can make the difference between life and death. Or taking a ration pack and turning that into a distillation device in which they can heat salt water and then cool the steam into fresh drinking water. And in fact, most of these techniques, at one time or other, have actually been employed for real. The only equipment available to the students is what they would have with them in their parachute packs if they really did have to eject from their aircraft. One of the key pieces of equipment they would have with them is an axe, but some of them are struggling to use this tool properly, in this case to make feather sticks for fire lighting. Probably would be, yeah. Can I help you with that? Oh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. So that's not sharp enough for the job. Right. The difference that a sharp tool will, will have is considerable. Yeah, I see, yeah. so, but there's a lesson there. I, mean, I know you haven't got sharpening stones at the moment, but in your kits you have them. The importance of being able to sharpen a tool and keeping it sharp can't be underestimated. Part of this survival course is about giving people time to experiment with natural materials. Grass, for example, provides excellent insulation for clothing or bedding. As the course develops, the students will be expected to sleep in shelters made solely from what they can find around them. OK, this is the shelter that you're going to be using for 
The next phase of the course is the thermal A-frame and it's a standard shelter that we'd recommend for almost all environments, other than probably in places where you can't get wood or even in the jungle where uh, you don't want to be sleeping on the ground. A-frame shelters are basic to construct, but in extreme environments have time and again proved to be lifesavers. The key is to make this shelter just big enough to cover your whole body. Some tips there. Who's new? It's very difficult to make one of these uh, lattice like this work. Uh -huh. you, know, you keep falling apart, don't they? Yeah. All Much time. easier is to, to build it with these rafters closer together. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And instead of trying to make a lattice like this, yeah. What you can do is just they've got natural hooks and things on them. Just hook them in at an angle like that. Yeah. With one end on the ground, crisscross them a, a bit like that, and you'll affect the same. But it's a lot easier. You can just lay it on, let gravity do the work. Okay. And, and make sure these aren't too long. If these poke out too much, they catch the rain and it runs onto the underside and takes a fast track to you. Okay. Okay? Yeah, no worries. That's what I'm after. See that ruse? Yeah. We can use that. We have to uncover it very carefully. Use that like wire. That's quite good, eh? <laughs> that. I think I need, to get, I need to get bigger bits. Now. Yeah. When building this shelter, it's important to stack plenty of layers of branches and moss on the outside to give protection from the wind and rain, packing the center with loads of bracken or dry grass for insulation. Do you feel you might ever be in a situation where you had to fall back on these skills? Um, yeah, I mean, certainly we went out at the, at the moment in the Balkans, Bosnia, uh, and into Kosovo, and certainly these kind of skills, it's this, it's this kind of woodland that uh, you're going to end up in. Um, so if you do end up in, uh, in enemy territory, or even in, in friendly territory, but there's uh, a time before the guys can come and get you out, you need to be able to survive, you need to be able to protect yourself, uh, and this is you know, the, the ideal way of doing it. Fire is the most important skill of survival. Fire relates to protection in that it can warm you. It relates to location, it can give your presence away to rescuers. It concerns water and it makes it safe to drink, and it concerns food in that it makes foods edible. It's very important, you mustn't underestimate it. I've devoted my life to learning traditional methods of fire lighting, and in most parts of the world, I can get a fire going just with the materials I find in nature. There you go. All military personnel carry fire sticks in their survival packs, but actually using them successfully isn't always as easy as it looks. It did work earlier on. <laughs> <laughs> well, you start to hear that now, you hear this crackling. That's air getting in amongst it as it starts to burn. OK? Thanks, mate. This instructor is demonstrating the art of making a signal fire to attract passing aircraft. The trick with this fire is to use dry tinder at the bottom and wet leafy material on top. This combination creates vast plumes of white smoke, which will hopefully penetrate the forest canopy and alert passing planes. All right. However, There's an old saying in survival, Proper preparation prevents poor performance, and these words should be remembered when building signal fires. In this case, a potential rescue aircraft would have been and gone by the time these students got their fire going. Survival techniques take years to learn, so these RAF personnel can't be expected to learn it all in a matter of weeks. But they're not playing at it. In a real survival situation, they'll need to know how to find food, by both fair means or foul. Try again. Mm. On your walkabouts, you may come across a tree where there are obvious signs of squirrels. And if you, you'll know there's squirrels up there because there's chattering noises. You can see them jumping from branch to branch occasionally. Put snares all around the tree. When he's stuck his head in there, he's going to be pulling on it and so on. He won't tend to fall and die in this position. This is where use of its body weight comes in because as he struggles, he will kick off 
and move to one side. They are very, very agile, and the more slack you've got on it, the harder it's going to be for him to get away. You're going to want to find some other methods of catching things, and by taking the inner cord from inside the parachute cord, you can make an interesting trap for ground feeding birds. Get any fruit that you can off of a tree, and then thread it through a piece of your inner cord. You want a couple of metres of line that the bird finds this in the location where he's already used to eating the fruit and then works his way along eating and swallowing the line as he goes all the way along until he reaches an area where he's run out of fruit and it's also tethered directly to a peg strongly driven into the ground. He'll try and walk away but he's already ingested about two meters of cord wrapped up into his stomach so he's not able to move. As long as you check it regularly, you'll be the one who catches this bird and not some other predator like a fox. They are good eating. Okay, they started to become quite popular in a number of restaurants, which tend to sort of die out because people don't like the idea of eating something that's cute and furry. But because of the nature of the animal, there's very little fat on it. It's a very, very nice tasting meat. All that's perfectly edible and will make good eating. Even though these men and women could go to war at any time, it's clear that some of them find the prospect of eating a squirrel unappealing. But they need this kind of exposure. People have died in survival situations because they couldn't cope with the idea of killing and eating animals, either for moral reasons or simply repulsion. Once again, a very effective method of cooking because you're going to sear it and so it's going to be safe to eat. Obviously by keeping the skin retains a layer of fat, fat being a very important ingredient in this file situation. But if you don't want the fat, it's very simple to peel it off. We're not looking at things necessarily that taste delicious and look like something we buy from Sainsbury's on a weekend. We're looking at something that in extremis is going to keep us alive. It's lovely. On this course, RAF personnel aren't expected to live off wild animals. Instead, they're given a pheasant or chicken to pluck, gut and cook. As so many people are used to eating cellophane-wrapped meat, students often struggle with the basics of preparing a bird for roasting. Feathers were coming off easily, got into the skin, and you can see there's maggots and worms and God knows what else. So um, this one will definitely have to be buried and gotten rid of as far from camp as possible. In fact, there's nothing wrong with this bird. What he thought were maggots was actually corn inside the bird's gizzard, a costly mistake when you're starving. <laughs> I wouldn't like to kill the animal, but if, um, if I was hungry enough, which I'm sure I would get in that situation, then yeah, I'd have to. In long-term survival situations, meat becomes very important because in this temperate environment, you simply can't live on plants alone for any length of time. And particularly here with acidic soils and winter on its way, edible plants are almost impossible to find. But there are some useful plants like this one, this is sphagnum moss. Now that can be cleaned up, boiled, strained and dried to be ready to use as a wound dressing because it's incredibly absorbent. And in fact, it was used in both the First and the Second World Wars for field dressings. And there's, then there's this, this is polypody. And this fern, the root of it, could be made into teas to treat bronchial disorders and sore throats. Both useful medicines for people on the run. Dartmoor is a very beautiful place to be. I always like coming here. Down there in that wood, that's where the students are in camp at the moment. Nice cosy experience, warm fires, shelters. That's all going to end tonight because then they have to do a night navigation exercise. Now Dartmoor is famous for being difficult to navigate in by daylight because of the barren, featureless terrain. But tonight, it'll be even more difficult. They're going to have to pay really careful attention to their compass bearings and the paces they're taking. Added to that, they've got to cross one of the most remote parts of the moor and navigate around deep bogs. The reason students are going to have to navigate at night is because that's what they'd have to do in a combat survival situation. Lie low during the day and move at night under the cover of darkness.
The teams are just about to set off on their night navigation exercise. Now navigation is a critical skill of survival. Many survival situations start because people can't navigate properly. They're not being tested here, it's just an opportunity to refresh their abilities and to remind them of the importance of this skill. It's going to be conducted at night because in a wartime situation, movement by night is still the soldier's friend, despite all of the advances in modern night viewing technology. We used an image intensifier to film the exercise. If you haven't got a compass, on a clear night you can use the stars to point you in the right direction. This constellation behind me here is called the Plough, the Great Bear or the Big Dipper. That would be the handle of the dipper and that's the bucket end if you like. Now, if you take these two end stars here and you join them up and keep going up, that star there, the first bright one you come to is Polaris. And if you're facing that, you're facing true north. So that's north, that's south of me, that's west and that's east. As each of the groups come to the end of their 20 kilometre hike, news is suddenly sprung on them that the exercise has been extended for an undisclosed period of time. Up to this point, they were under the impression that they would be returning to base for a hot bath and a trip down to the local curry house. Not now. Using all your equipment, move into the forest and as individuals address the priorities of survival, protection, location, water and food. By now the students have spent over a week roughing it on the moors and for some of them the strain is beginning to show. After walking sort of across Dartmoor and uh, a day up and, a, and a no sleep last night really because of the, uh, because of the cold, I can't say I really enjoy all that. I'd, I'd prefer to be at home, let's put it that way, watching telly or something, or in, or in bed with a wife. <laughs> but wouldn't we all? <laughs> this is when the course steps up a gear. The students are now being tested on their resolve to continue with essential tasks, however exhausted and emotionally drained they might be feeling. How are you feeling? Um, pretty run down, actually. And how do you notice that? What, what sorts of things are different for you now? Well, it's uh, time-wise, really. It's more a matter of, you know, you get up and you do maybe five minutes work and then I'm finding myself getting really dehydrated at the moment, so five minutes to take some water. In peacetime circumstances, 
But from this point forward, the teams are on the ground in enemy territory, being pursued by a hunter force whose sole intent is their capture. Now they have to meet all of their basic needs, protection, location, water and food, whilst also employing classified techniques to enable their safe extraction by friendly forces. Over three days and nights, this hunter force will use a whole range of military hardware to try and catch the survival course members hiding out on Dartmoor. Because the RAF's tactics for enemy evasion are classified, we cannot disclose specific details of this exercise. But the value to the RAF course members of enduring a combat survival situation, the experience of being hunted day and night, cannot be underestimated. The students seen here filming themselves have been on the run for two days. The big problem we've got is actually finding a decent site to, uh, <coughs> to set up camp. So what we're doing is basically just finding an open area that we can set up easily and also move quickly from. That way if Hunter Force comes in and into this area that we can grab our kit and move quickly. I think we're pretty pleased with this so far tonight that uh, we got here without even a, a sniff of anyone around and hopefully they won't have the faintest idea where we are. Having remained undetected, their sole objective now is to be rescued by Allied forces. Using special techniques which we cannot show, they manage to contact friendly forces, in this case an RAF helicopter crew, and arrange a rendezvous point for rescue. By the time the students were rescued from Dartmoor, only two out of the group of 20 course members had been caught by the hunter force. Having had the chance to practice escape and evasion, they now have a more realistic understanding of the real problems they would face behind enemy lines. The worst case scenario only of these military personnel can face is the prospect of being shot down behind enemy lines. Hopefully, the training they've received will enable them to return safely to their friends and families. To my mind, it doesn't matter though whether you're a soldier or a hiker. You can load yourself down with all the best equipment in the world, but the chances are when you need it most, it simply isn't going to be there. That's when survival training really comes into its own. There's an old saying, knowledge is the key to survival. And the real beauty of that is that it doesn't weigh anything.